I am delighted to introduce Mr. Ali Soufan, the Chairman and CEO of the Soufan Group. Formerly an FBI Supervisory Special Agent, Mr. Soufan played a crucial role in domestic and international counterterrorism operations, including the investigations of the East Africa MC bombings and the attack on the USS Cole and events surrounding 9 11. Currently, he serves as a member of the Homeland Security Advisory Council and is a leading expert in national security and counterterrorism. He has published two books on these subjects, with a third book, The Black Banners Declassified, How Torture Derailed the War on Terror After 9-11, being released later this year. Without further ado, I look forward to what Mr. Sufan has to say on the nature of intelligence sharing and counterterrorism today. Thank you, um, and uh, it's a great uh, honor to be uh, with you today. Um, I hope that uh, we can discuss uh, more about the threat that we are facing today, uh, not only with the Salafi Jihadi movement, um, Al-Qaeda and ISIS and the terrorism threat as we know it, but also with the new threats that's emerging um, from disinformation to the rise of uh, white supremacy. Uh, nearly uh, nine years after Osama bin Laden was brought to justice, and despite uh, a lot of our efforts uh, on the military front, intelligence, on law enforcement, uh, despite the so-called global war on terrorism, uh, unfortunately, we have uh, defeated neither the organization uh, Osama bin Laden has founded, nor the wider Salafi jihadi movement that he championed. On the contrary, uh, Al-Qaeda's fighting strength today uh, is an order of magnitude larger than it was when Osama bin Laden died. You know, on the eve of 9-11, uh, bin Laden had about 400 members of Al-Qaeda who pledged allegiance to him. Today, you don't need anyone to tell you about how many thousands upon thousands of fighters who adhere to Al-Qaeda's narratives and to Osama bin Laden's uh, ideology are spread around the world. You can just look at Yemen. Uh, and the number, the, the big numbers, the thousands of AQIP fighters in the country or a Sahel region or Somalia or Idlib in Syria and so forth. And uh, that also does not count the tens of thousands uh, more who pledge allegiance to another Salafi Jihadi movement, uh, basically Al-Qaeda breakaway rival, uh, ISIS. Um, so in addition to the threat stemming from the Salafi Jihadi terrorism, um, the sectarian violence has become synonymous with conflicts in the Middle East and um, has given rise uh, to an empowered pro-Iranian uh, militant groups across the region, many of which have already been uh, designated as terrorist organizations, both uh, by the U.S. and members of the international community. Um, I think overall, though, we enjoyed numerous uh, tactical victories against Al-Qaeda and against ISIS. Uh, most of the individuals who compromised Al-Qaeda's operational leadership on the eve of 9-11 uh, are either dead or in jail. And almost all the areas that has been captured by ISIS um, has been reclaimed. So tactically, I think there is nothing we cannot do. However, all our tactical um, um, successes uh, have amounted to a strategic failure. Uh, unfortunately, that stems from the fact that we truly um, lacked understanding and we continue to lack an understanding why the ideology, why the narrative of organizations like Al-Qaeda have spread across the Muslim world. <clears throat> we um, lack the understanding why these narratives are resilient and they endured uh, the campaigns that we had militarily and uh, from an intelligence uh, point of view. And I think at this point, we need to understand that only by defeating the conditions that allowed the appeal of that narrative in the heart and mind of so many around the world, we can only win the war. Um, from that perspective, I would like to also go to another threat that we've been seeing uh, around the world today, especially in Western countries, and it's white supremacy extremism. So on top of the Salafi Jihadi threat, we are now faced with a growing threat of white supremacy, which arguably poses a bigger threat down the road to our Western societies, United States, England, Germany, and so forth. 
So in the United States, for example, you go from Pittsburgh to Poway to Charleston to El Paso, and we see that white supremacy extremists poses a clear terrorist threat to the United States. And while extremist groups operating on American soil are often labeled or, uh, uh, or, or described as domestic terrorist organizations, I think they maintain links to transnational networks of like-minded organizations and individuals. And we see uh, these networks operating effectively in places like Australia, Canada, uh, all across of Europe, Russia, South Africa, and elsewhere, even in countries like Brazil. So the white supremacist extremists strengthening transnational networks. And now we notice that they are in, uh, imitating uh, the tactics and the techniques and even the procedures of groups like Al-Qaeda and like the Islamic States. So they share the same approach uh, for recruitment, financing, propaganda. Uh, Ukraine now and the conflict of Ukraine is emerging as a hub in the broader uh, network of transnational white supremacy extremists. They are attracting uh, foreign recruits from uh, many Western countries. Uh, we've seen uh, in the past how jihadis traveled uh, to Afghanistan, and we see them now traveling to other conflict zones to include Syria and uh, the Sahel. Um, so uh, white supremacists now have their own uh, theater in which our supremacists have their own theater um, uh, in which they meet each other, they learn how, uh, you know, to, 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 to recruit and to share experiences and uh, the art of war and combat, and that is in Ukraine. And we've seen them fighting on both sides of the conflict. Some go and uh, join the pro-Russian separatists and some go and join elements that's uh, fighting and operating um, under uh, the Ukrainian uh, government. So today, the white supremacist terrorism, for example, is responsible for more death in the United States than uh, the jihadi terrorists since 9-11. We see white supremacists make a propaganda warning of an alleged great replacement of whites in the same way jihadis uh, talk of a supposed war against Islam. Uh, white supremacists to promote violence as appropriate to defend the purity of the race, uh, very much similar to how the jihadis promote violence to protect the purity of uh, their uh, religion. Both groups uh, recruit followers and reinforce their message through social media. Uh, while jihadis make martyrdom videos, white supremacist terrorists post uh, online manifestos. And most importantly, white supremacists from around the world are um, increasingly uh, creating a narrative, conspiratorial narrative, uh, to appeal to recruits very similar to what the jihadis did in the late 80s and 90s. Um, so this is basically, in general, uh, some of the stuff that we are, you know, witnessing uh, today. But there's other other thing that we have to keep in mind is basically the disinformation, because disinformation, not only by entities or by countries like Russia or like China or like Iran, we have a lot of disinformation that's happening in our societies to take advantage of the social, sometimes racial, economic grievances, and literally put oil on the fire. And this is coming from countries who oppose liberal democracies. You probably experienced it in the UK, we experienced it in the US, they experienced it before elections in France and in Germany and so forth. So they put a lot of conspiracy theories out there. And a lot of these conspiracy theories are being utilized by people on the French from the left and from the right. And yes, white supremacists are benefiting from this. And actually it helped them uh, going from the fringe to be more mainstream in politics based on the narratives that they have. So we've seen now how they are taking advantage of uh, pandemics, for example. Look at COVID-19, look at all the conspiracies that's coming from COVID-19. COVID-19 is like literally like <laughs> a buffet for every conspiracy theorist in the world.
The jihadis have their own thing. Al-Qaeda, for example, in Somalia, put some propaganda that COVID-19 was brought to the world by the, um, you know, the Crusaders' soldiers, meaning uh, Western troops. Uh, the Chinese are saying, hey, the Americans did it. And guess what? Al-Qaeda will jump on that narrative saying, see, we told you. We told you it is uh, the American army and the Crusaders' soldiers who did it. Um, you have... The white supremacists uh, going back to their anti-Semitic conspir uh, conspiracies, uh, basically saying it's George Soros and the Rothschild family and it's uh, immigrants who brought the disease to Western society in order to get rid of the white race. Um, you have ISIS uh, making claims that uh, uh, this is a conspiracy to kill Muslims in the Muslim world. So everybody is jumping on these conspiracies and they are actually uh, piggybacking on other existing conspiracies. For example, there's a lot of people who are anti-5G. So suddenly the people who are anti-5G have all these ammunition, most of it false most of it given to them by the Russians or the Chinese or whatever to create division in the society that, you know what, the 5G towers is how they spread COVID. And so many believed in that. We have attacks on towers, cell towers, that's not even 5G, but people believe it is 5G here in the US. And that's why uh, we have COVID. You have the anti-vaxxers with a lot of their uh, concerns about vaccination uh, being, uh, being um, uh, um, exaggerated by a lot of disinformation campaigns that's connected to, to COVID. So disinformation is uh, significant, and I think there is a significant role for two things, for people to self-educate and to and people like you to help educate uh, people in your circles, and for the social media um, platforms to be responsible and to be held accountable for what's on their platform. Anti-Semitism, hate, terrorism, false information that impact public health and, um, and, 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 and social safety uh, and security needs uh, to be, you know, needs to be taken very seriously uh, by, by, by these platforms. So this is in general where I believe we sit to, today. And I will be very happy to uh, entertain uh, your questions and have an open discussion about uh, what I've said and about anything else that you guys would like to discuss. Okay, great. Thanks very much for the start uh, with the conversation, I think. Um, I suppose... Uh, I'm sorry, you're, uh, you're breaking a little bit. I can't hear you, uh, Sam. Oh, is that my internet? Is it... Better yeah, now. that's better now. Better now. Okay, great. Sorry. Uh, no, that's that's a great place to, to start the conversation, I think, in terms of how uh, important narratives are in sort of leading, uh, you know, to a, to a growth in terrorism. Um, I suppose it'd be interesting to sort of hear you elaborate some more on, like, the idea of how we go about educating people that, uh, you know, when the disinformation doesn't necessarily exist within our own domestic countries, but abroad and sort of getting that balance right between intervening in information campaigns whilst not being overbearing uh, in the eyes of like, local populations. I mean, this is uh, probably one of the most complicated things that every government is dealing with. And I um, let me push back a little bit on the idea that we're not affected from it in our societies. We are affected. Uh, in our societies. You've seen what happened in the 2016 election. You've seen what happened with a lot of the disinformation in, in Brexit on both sides of the debate in the UK. You've seen um, what's continuing to happen with uh, the disinformation about the pandemic and how there is a significant push by China and other countries by saying that liberal democracies uh, cannot deal with international crises anymore. Uh, they haven't been able to uh, provide um, you know, uh, safety and, 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 and security from the pandemic to their own people. And the Chinese are bringing this idea that um, they have the solution. They are the world leaders now. They are sending these masks and these equipments to countries, even in the Western world, um, that don't have enough because their system is not good enough. Now, this is all lies. This is all disinformation. Because guess what? We have a pandemic today, 
because of the Chinese Communist Party inability to be transparent and to deal with it effectively when it came out. That is the reason we have it. Second, a lot of the equipments that they are sending, as you know, and as you read in the economists and in all other, they don't even work, right? Third, democratic countries have been able to effectively deal with COVID more than dictatorship, more than countries that have been led by strong men. Look at the, look how Brazil is, is a disaster. You know, I think uh, Brazil, I think they have more people dying every day than any other country in the world is because of their president, you know, basically said, hey, it's just a cold. Uh, and, uh, and the media is exaggerating it. Uh, very similar to what President Trump uh, said early in the United States, that it's a hoax and it's only like a cold. Um, so there are lots of disinformation that's happening. And unfortunately, the Western world is not um, you know, responding to this disinformation. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you look at the countries that dealt with the pandemic very effectively, you will see countries like Germany, democratic country, country like uh, South uh, Korea, democratic country, country like in New Zealand, democratic country, Canada, democratic country. So yes, every now and then, because of the political leadership in some um, nations, Western nations, we were a little bit late to respond, but we were way more effective in dealing with it than communist and authoritarian and dictatorships around the world. Uh, unfortunately, I think um, this information is getting bigger and bigger and larger and larger, and more influence because there is no, um, because this is the first time we have a global um, crisis and we don't have global leadership. The U.S. is nowhere to be found. And I think this is one of the biggest problems that we're having today, the lack, the void of global leadership. And nature by itself does not like void. Something is going to fill it. And the Chinese and the Russians and even regionally, the Turks and the Iranians are trying to figure out how they can fill their void, this void, either directly or through non-state actors that they operate under their um, umbrella. I, I'm curious how much you think that the um, sort of the, the inability of a lot of Western nations to use their, you know, their, their vast intelligence capabilities in terms of collection, uh, but seem unable to actually counteract, say, disinformation campaigns and to effectively act as, say, like Western coalitions uh, and countering all of this disinformation. Um, you know, part of this is not putting enough pressure on social media. Um, but like, what do you think the role is of um, these Western countries in, in, as intelligence powers in countering these, these disinformation campaigns? I think that's an excellent question. And frankly, our system works totally against us on this. Because in our countries, we have something called freedom of speech, right? And, and people can basically say, well, this is my freedom of speech to say anything. I, I can say false information. I can say false narrative. As long as these platforms are not regulated, right, it's going to be a problem. And I think we regulate cable news. We regulate newspapers. We regulate magazines. And I think we need to have a code of ethics for these social media platforms because frankly most of the population of the world today they get their news from social media platforms not from the tv and not from newspapers so we need to hold them accountable in a democratic society to the same level that we hold newspapers magazines and so forth accountable so far they are not they're, they're not being held accountable so our system is working against us but if you look at the chinese or at the russians or at the saudis or at the egyptians or at any of these countries around the world they're not allowing these things to happen in arabic on their platforms and all these platforms who talk about you know act holier than thou about the democratic principles and the freedom of speech and they are not the arbiter of truth you know, they bend over to the Chinese and China and they give them the keys to the kingdom in order for them to operate. Because you know what? They don't care about any of these values. Don't let anybody fool you. I deal with them all the time. They deal, they care only about one thing, money. And how do you do money in platforms? Engagement. And how do you go to engagement, create engagement? By, um, by the extremes, by putting the extremes against each other. 
So if you want to go now and say, I am depressed, how can I deal with my depression? I can guarantee you in less than five click, you will be on some white supremacist or jihadi website. That's how they create engagement. Emotions, passions means data and means money. And I think we need to start creating awareness for people to know that they are using them <laughs> to make money out of them. And they are using the disruption that's happening in our society to make profit for these platforms. Uh, especially coming as somebody from a, an FBI background, I'm curious what you think of the a common argument against that is sort of the better the enemy that you know. These white supremacist groups are using Facebooks, they're using these public pages that uh, our intelligence agencies and, and uh, law enforcement can get access to. Uh, and the concern is that as you put more barriers uh, on these social media accounts, uh, they'll simply migrate to somewhere in the dark web, somewhere that's harder and more difficult for law enforcement to track. Uh, do you think that argument has merit? You know what? I think it does not fit in a way with what's happening because these guys, what they do with the narratives that they put out there is to find recruits. And when they find recruits, they are going to communicate on other channels. So you have more covert channels that they do, like uh, HM, like gaming, for example, was huge now. You know, you think people are playing Call of Duty, but actually they were actually talking about operations and you know while, while they are playing. So they are moving to other platforms to do so. So I can't say, for example, um, let's say you know. Um, Anna went to a movie theater, crowded, and she starts screaming, fire, 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 and everybody starts stumbling on each other. And then I came, well, well, at least we know that Anna was in the movie theater. Well, it doesn't matter because she's creating a havoc being in the movie theater. So I think even when it comes to, uh, you know, news, we need, as, as people, we need to think before we link. That's number one. But number two, these platforms need to have the responsibility not to allow disinformation on their platforms. So we're not talking about the operational um, way that terrorist groups function, but we're talking about the poisonous and conspiratorial narratives that they are putting there, creating because of their algorithm echo chamber that's dividing the population and that idiot who used to be on the fringe, not even allowed to open his mouth with his friends about all these conspiracies by the Jews and taking over the world. Now they go on Facebook and it's like, whoo, I have thousands of people who agree with me on this. See, we're empowered, we're there. We need to be basically very careful about allowing false conspiratorial and hateful narrative from spreading on social media and holding social media platforms accountable for not creating algorithm that promote this kind of narrative. Some of the, uh, the doctors in China that were early reporters of COVID-19 um, were jailed and the, the charge that they were jailed on was spreading false rumors. Do you see a path forward for Western societies to combat disinformation in a way that remains compatible with, for example, in the U.S., the First Amendment and the, the principles of free speech without a government arbiter of what can and cannot be said? You don't need to do a government arbiter. I mean, look, you know, <clears throat> we need to basically start doing a couple of things. First of all, holding them accountable. The moment that they are able to sue them, because of false information, because, you know, I'm talking about social media entities, um, then they will think twice. Because again, they care about money. It's exactly like a newspaper now. When they want to publish something, they have to check the facts because they are scared that, you know, if they said something bad about you, you're, they are scared that you're going to have a lawyer and say, I'm going to sue you for what you said about me. So they have to fact check a lot of these things. This is a, their responsibility. They have editorial responsibility in dealing with this. The reason they are not doing it is because it costs money and it impacts their business model. So that's why they don't want to do it. That's number one. As what happened in China is a totally something different. China, 
arrested these doctors because these doctors were trying to say, this is a pandemic, we have to pay attention to it, when the Chinese government, for economic reasons, were saying, there is nothing here to say, right? So this is just another example of the Communist Party trying to suppress the truth about a pandemic. And because of these actions, because of um, these, you know, like the doctor who died, for example, the one who started with exposing uh, COVID-19 and he died in, in a hospital bed in China, um, you know, those guys, um, they were trying to warn China and warn the world. Um, however, the, uh, the authoritarian nature of the regime and the Communist Party did not allow this to happen because they thought it will be bad news and bad publicity. And economically, it might have a significant impact on China. So these two, you know, I, I don't think it is kind of like connected directly to what's happening on social media. In your talk, you sort of highlighted how what can seemingly be a domestic terrorist organization that has international links. Um, and so in order to combat those groups effectively, do you think uh, intelligence sharing is at a level that allows that to be effectively done um, or not? I think intelligence sharing is a lot better now than it used to be before 9-11. A lot of structural changes were put in place in order to open the channels of communication between the different intelligence and law enforcement agencies. So this is positive development. Uh, when it comes to, for example, white supremacy, I think uh, in the UK has a better system than the US because I think uh, MI6 and MI5 in Scotland Yard uh, get the authorities not to differentiate between domestic terrorism and international terrorism. In the United States, we don't have domestic terrorism laws, right? So even Timothy McVeigh, who blew up a truck in a federal building, killing so many people, um, um, was not charged with uh, terrorism, believe it or not. Uh, he was charged with murder and using, using weapons of mass destructions. Um, the reason is, in the United States, there is this strong belief about First Amendment and uh, any domestic terrorism charges um, can uh, challenge, be challenged through the First Amendment. In the U.S., we only have terrorism when it comes to foreign, foreign entities. So in the U.S., if you want to declare an entity as a terrorist organization, it's always foreign terrorist organizations. And there are two ways you can do it. Either you can go through Congress and have a legislation to create a group like Hezbollah or Hamas or Al-Qaeda or ISIS as a foreign terrorist organization, or through executive order. The executive order was issued after 9-11 uh, and it has been updated recently. Um, and then uh, the State Department, uh, under that executive order, can declare an entity as a specially designated foreign terrorist organization. So what you notice in both that it's foreign terrorist organization. So we don't have domestic. We don't even have um, uh, uh, penalties associated with domestic terrorism. And it is extremely difficult to, um, to, um, to declare uh, this charge or to use this charge. So that makes it very difficult for us to collect intelligence and share intelligence about this emerging threat of white supremacy. And frankly, it was very difficult to us to do it until 9-11, when we started to use material support and other things after the jihadis um, attacked us on 9-11, even though we had other terrorist attacks before on the World Trade Center, for example, bombing 1993 and so forth. So um, we cannot, we as law enforcement and intelligence, cannot use the tools available today to collect to levy criminal charges, to prosecute uh, individuals who are part of the domestic terrorism, like white supremacist groups and stuff like that. Because we cannot use these tools that's available to combat international terrorism domestically. We can use it if we can prove that person or that group is connected to a foreign terrorist organization. So one of the things that I started to do here, and I did it through Congress, and probably you guys read about it, we started to put pressure on the U.S. government 
to designate white supremacist organizations overseas and go after the people who work with them domestically. So the very first group that has been designated so far, and it's historic because the U.S. for the very first time in our history, we designate a white supremacist organization as a terrorist group, was RIM, the Russian Imperial Movement. They are connected to many white supremacist organizations and individuals here in the United States. They recruit people to go and fight in the conflict in the Ukraine. And now with this especially designated um, this, it was especially designated organization. Now we're challenging the Justice Department. What kind of tools prosecutors and FBI agents are allowed to use to go under people who operate under this network? Taliban is another specially designated group. And we use a lot of the tools to combat Taliban, prevent them from funding, from recruiting, from reaching out to people in the United States. So now we wanted to use the same tools to combat RIM and the groups that exist here. The UK designated two organizations, white supremacist terrorist organizations. Uh, Germany designated people. Canada designated people. Um, now those you know, like, for example, the UK and Canada are part of the five eyes, right? So you know what the five eyes are, right? You know, so they are part of the five eyes. So, okay, so our allies designated this group as a terrorist organization. Are we going to start uh, working with them in combating uh, the people who raise funds for them or train with them here in the United States? This is the argument that we're having. Otherwise, it is extremely difficult at this point to utilize a lot of the reforms that we had in sharing intelligence domestically and with our allies around the world um, to utilize it on this emerging white supremacist threat. So we are still way behind the, the, a -ball, the eight ball. But with the other stuff, yeah, absolutely. With the jihadis, we can do that. You talked a bit about um, the importance of defeating the conditions that allow appeal to extremist narrative in multiple groups. So do you think that improving the financial security of citizens broadly in society would, for example, help to dampen um, the white supremacist extremist perceptions of the threat of non-white immigrants? Or do you think it's purely a cultural question? No, I think definitely they are depending on a lot of the socioeconomic uh, conditions that exist. I mean, you have a lot of areas, uh, I'm sure you have it in the UK, we have it here in the US, um, that used to depend on mining or used to depend on industries that doesn't exist. You have factories that shut down because they moved to China because it's a cheaper. So you have people who feel that they are left behind. And um, because they feel that they are left behind, they are willing to listen to some people who come and tell them, um, this is why you're left behind. Give them a very simple explanation to a very complicated problem. And they will say, look, you know, you're left behind because they are white, because they are taking jobs to nine white people. They want to bring nine white people or non British or non Americans to come and take you to job. It depends because these groups are not monolithic. Everybody has various degrees of, of supremacy and uh, ultranationalist agendas. So, so yeah, I mean, and, and, and the problem is uh, governments are responsible for this. I, I remember with NAFTA, when they were discussing NAFTA, I was actually in, in college. And one of the issues that they were trying, you know, they, you know, we, 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 we had a class on political economy and one of the issues was, okay, what's going to happen to all these people who are going to lose their jobs? And um, because the factory is going to move to Mexico at the time with NAFTA. And the whole thing by the government was, oh, no, don't worry, because now the economy is shifting and we're going to be uh, a knowledge based economy and you know we're going to train all these people and computers and 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 and, and a lot of the you know uh, in new technologies uh, we heard about green technologies and all these things because that's going to be the future okay great you know so you're going to give them money you're going to train them you're going to give them capabilities where they can actually you know work new jobs uh, give them training um, and uh, so they will continue to make money and actually you will make more money because of globalism. Now we are the banking system in the world. We are the services. We are where all the headquarters are of all these companies. Great, fine and dandy. But you know what? They didn't do any of this. They didn't do any of this. The factory left. Um, now people have no jobs. 
now the county or the state or you know the the the, 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 the sorry the county or the the town or the village um, doesn't have enough taxes because people are not paying taxes they don't have school everything start collapsing the opium crisis came up and a lot of these people are looking for an answer and they are listen they are willing to listen to anybody who gives them an answer look what happened in germany after world war 1 the german people are very educated very sophisticated very metropolitan you know berlin was the most metropolitan city in the world at the time but because of the economic and the social condition that they were under afterward and the humiliation after world war 1 they were able to be brainwashed by somebody like Adolf Hitler. So I think your question is extremely important, and I believe it's both, you know, with the white supremacy. It's both. Definitely, there is a socioeconomic situation. And it's like with the jihadis. Like, for example, before the war in Yemen, for example, uh, the Saudi war in Yemen, Al-Qaeda were about 700 people. Al-Qaeda today is about 8,000 people in Yemen, right? So think about this. Now, I can guarantee you those 8,000 people don't believe in the Salafi Jihadi narrative, don't believe in, uh, in, in the ideology and the religion, uh, you know, like original Qaeda members. However, they need protection. They need social services. They need someone to get them water and get them electricity and get them medicine. Someone to protect them either from the government troops or from the Houthis, right? So they don't have a choice. Al-Qaeda is there, they can do the job, they will go and join Al-Qaeda to protect themselves. The same thing with white supremacy. A lot of these people are there because like, look, I don't have any other thing. It is opium or it's me trying to find a purpose for my life. And you know what? What this guy is telling me makes sense. I think that the comparison between white supremacist terrorism and Islamist terrorism is really striking. And I've seen a characterization, at least in Western countries, for both of those ideologies, of a shift towards an emphasis on lone wolf attacks rather than organizing. And do you think this represents a new threat to intelligence agencies and law enforcement, or do you think it shows a mitigation that they don't feel comfortable trying to organize in larger groups? I if think this characterization uh, is correct. Well, I think it's a phase. You know, a face. Um, they know if they start doing something organized, uh, law enforcement and intelligence. Look what happened to Al Qaeda after Al Qaeda started doing organized attacks in the East Africa embassy bombing USS Cole, 9/11. So, so I think this is phase one. They are still in in the recruitment phase, um, and uh, and I think there there is a still uh, significant problems, at least for us in the United States to disrupt them and to stop them from doing these things because of the lack of domestic terrorism legislation. Let me give you an example of how we deal with the situation now. So let's say I'm a wacko white supremacist. Um, Sam is my neighbor. He knows I'm wacko white supremacist. He follows me on Facebook um, just because I'm his crazy neighbor. One day I go and say, I'm going to go and kill all the Jews, these Jewish blah, 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 blah. They are doing blah, 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 blah. I'm going to go and shoot them all. And then he looks from his window and he sees me taking machine gun with ammo, dressed up tactical in a tactical uniform and going to my car. So Sam being the good citizen that he is, he picked up the phone immediately. He warned the FBI. Right, the FBI goes and they stop me when I was heading to a synagogue. Right, they get me out of the car, they take the weapons, they take the ammunition, and they want to file charges, terrorism against me. Right, and I said, What are you talking about? I'm not going to the synagogue. I'm going to McDonald's across the street from the synagogue. I want to buy a burger, and then after that, I want to go to the range. The fact that I said all these things on Facebook is protected by First Amendment. The fact that I have all the weapons in my car, that's protected by the Second Amendment. Now, I gave you that example, but these are happening a lot in the US. So now the FBI can file charges on violating the Telecommunication Act, basically saying, 
obscene things on the internet. And good luck for any federal judge to take that because of the First Amendment. And they end up releasing these guys and sometimes giving them back their weapons. Right? Now, if that guy was an ISIS guy, it's a totally different because it's material support. You start building a case, material support of terrorism. Material support we cannot use in domestic issues unless it's connected to a foreign terrorist organization. You see the complexity of this? So now we have a complicated situation that we're dealing with. There's another organization here in the United States called RAM, Rise, Against, uh, Rise Above Movement, white supremacist groups. We're planning to do a lot of terrorist, war, uh, a lot of um, chaotic acts uh, around the, the, the rally in Charlottesville. Um, Unite the Right rally. Um, they wanted to start race war, right? So they went to Ukraine. They met with Azov Battalion, which is a neo-Nazi group in the Ukraine. They came back. The FBI knew what they were doing, and they arrested them. And there's an indictment. You can read the complaint. You can Google it online, the in uh, complaint against Trump in federal court. So they basically said, look, we didn't do anything because we get arrested. So everything that happened is First Amendment. And guess what? The judge bought the argument and had them released. And the head of the organization now, he posts videos from outside the Kremlin. They went to Russia. So these are uh, structural problem we have in our system that makes it very difficult to share intelligence, to coordinate efforts uh, against uh, the threat of white supremacy. We are way more effective against jihadis because they are international terrorist organizations. So anybody who gives them support here can be challenged on material support and conspiracy. We cannot do that with white supremacists at this point. Sorry, I'm just telling you all these legal issues because I think you have to understand the legal structure in order to know how we can develop a policy or how we can change some of the legal things. Just because uh, they are, you know, we don't have domestic terrorism charges in the U.S., it doesn't mean we should let these guys operate. So we can use other things to get them, for example, start designating their allies overseas and work them internally like we do Al-Qaeda and ISIS. So there is ways to do it, but I think we're still at the very beginning and we have a way, a long, long way ahead of us. Uh, no, thank you. I, I think that's been some fantastic insight. Uh, unless anybody else has any other questions they'd like to chip in with, uh, I'd like to be respectful of your time. We're near in the 47 minute mark. Uh, anybody have anything else? I have uh, one more question. I was just wondering if you have any comments on um, Western countries' reputation in the world and if there are any particular strategies we should use to make sure that countries in trying to act against disinformation and terrorism don't compromise the ideals that like give them the, the moral um, platform, if you will. I think Western countries in the world, their, their, their reputation is not the same reputation as it used to be before uh, during the Cold War, for example. I think we're looked upon more as hypocrites. Uh, we only care about the human rights and democracy when uh, it, it is uh, to deal with uh, adversaries, uh, but uh, we really don't care about it much when it comes, uh, when it's from our dictators. I mean, President Trump famously said, where is my favorite dictator about CC or Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia cutting people in, 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 um, in a bone saw, uh, a journalist, a Washington Post journalist in, the bo in a bone saw and had no accountability. The murders that's going on in Yemen, no accountability from the UK and from the US. We still sell them weapon. We still go around the system. And when somebody in the US, like the inspector general of State Department says, hey, you know, that is illegal, they fire the inspector general. So more and more we're looking upon, upon as a hip, hypocrites and the Chinese and the Russians are definitely utilizing their social media uh, armies um, to, to do this. And we spoke a little bit about what the Chinese are doing for, with COVID, for example, or the Russians are doing with um, the domestic uh, stability in our countries. 
but I think uh, the world still need liberal democracies and we they need us to clean up our act. Um, the world uh, cannot operate without freedom because freedom is something inherently part of the human nature. And, and I think democracy and liberty and freedom are uh, extremely important. Um, we need to basically use our values in order to reestablish the leadership and uh, uh, the, um, the, 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 the primacy of liberal democracies. Our values is not some PR thing. Our values are not talking points. Our values is an essential nature uh, or, or, or part of what we are. So we can't say our values against torture, but hey, you know what? We can use it, but we call it enhanced interrogation techniques. So we don't call it use it, we can use it. We can say um, we want to put sanctions on countries because they oppress their people, right? Like Iran, for example. But in the same time, we give China um, the, um, uh, um, uh, trade status that nobody else has in the world just because we make money out of it. Uh, they did not have to do any changes after Tiananmen Square, and we gave them that status maybe about three or four years after Tiananmen Square. They didn't have to change their narrative about Taiwan. They didn't have to change the way they treated their people in China. And guess what? Guess what? We're okay with that. So I think when we start looking into um, our values as essential part of our foreign policy, of who we are, then we will lead the world again.